I mean, it's like, what else needs to happen until we're like, oh my God, this is true! Right? So did you think about the question that I asked you? Why is it that there are Christians and Jews that are still not pro-Israel? They're still not Zionists. How can that be? This is an open question. The historian said people just got used to it. Okay, I can hear that. Does anyone have any other ideas? They don't believe. They don't believe. Well, I would question that because every Buddhist, atheist, Christian needs to look at a book written thousands of years ago making impossible promises. And to the T, every single one has come to pass. That's pretty remarkable. The, don't, the people that won't believe, if they don't see that, they're not going to believe. I'm not even talking. I want to talk about the people that do believe. They do believe in God. They do believe in the Bible. How is it that they are not pro-Israel? They're afraid. That could be. Let me tell you, it's only going to get worse. I'm not kidding. I think it's going to get challenging to be pro-Israel. And you're going to have to have a lot of faith and a lot of courage. Chazak ve'ematz is what was told to Joshua. You have to be strong and courageous. Emunah, that's right. Here's my theory. I think that the whole world would be pro-Israel, but they're missing something. It's expectations. People have a certain vision of how they believe the redemption will unfold. They have visions of, of, of clouds and miracles and eagles coming and sweeping us up into heaven and carrying us off to Israel and these miraculous feats that God will perform for us. Well, we're looking at the state of Israel, and I don't see any giant eagles. In fact, it's all happened very naturally. And that's not what people expect. I'm going to tell you two stories now. One is about Ari. And those of you that have heard it, you're still going to laugh. And those of you that haven't heard it, you're definitely going to laugh. Ari is my co-host. He's my best friend. I love him dearly. We're best friends. We do everything together. We're learning partners together. Radio show, television show. We pray together. We look, we're everything together. He's about this tall and this big. He is much bigger than me. He's stronger than me. He's tougher than me. But 30 days out of the year, I am his commander. <laughs> Ari's from Houston, Texas. And once... He finished high school. He picked up and said, I'm moving to Israel. I'm enrolling in the IDF. I'm going to be a part of the first Jewish army since the times of King David. He was idealistic. He had a vision. He was led prophetically. Prophetic direction. That's what this country needs. He picked up and moved to Israel, and his Hebrew wasn't that great. Well, his first day in the Israeli army is basic training. To give you a little bit of background about what basic training is, try to imagine taking high school boys, high school boys, they're wild, they're irresponsible, and converting these wild Indians into soldiers. That's what happens in basic training. The discipline is like nothing you would ever see anywhere else other than the IDF in basic training. The, you don't see your commander's eyes for the first few weeks. They put their hats down low, so you're talking. It's as if you're talking to, they're not human, they're robots. They don't, there is such distance between your commanders. Ari's first day in the IDF, there's a Mizdar Machlaka, which means you meet your officers for the first time. His first day in the IDF, God bless him, Ari was late. Late. It wasn't his fault because he's what's called a lone soldier. A lone soldier means that he has no family in Israel. He left his family in Houston, picked up and moved to Israel, and the army now needs to take care of this boy. Who's going to do his clothes? Who's going to laundry and Shabbat? And what's he going to do when he leaves the army? So he was meeting with the secretary to make sure that he would have a place to be and that you know, the army takes care of lone soldiers. It wasn't his fault, but nonetheless, he was late. Everyone is standing at attention. Everyone is in their first day. Everyone is terrified, of course. No one is moving. The commanders are standing. The whole unit is standing. Ari comes running across the base. People from the side of their eyes are seeing this big guy come and running. 
His gun is clanking. He comes running in. He's terrified. And he says, I'm so sorry. Excuse me. Slicha shani mechoar. I'm so sorry. Excuse me for being mechoar. In Hebrew, though, meuchar is late. Meuchar is late. Mechoar is ugly. <laughs> so his first day in the IDF, Ari says, Excuse me, sir, I'm sorry for being so ugly. <laughs> Tough break. You know, no, no one knew what to say. <laughs> so, of course, all of the soldiers broke out laughing. All the commanders started laughing. Uh-oh. The last thing you want to do on your first day in the IDF is to make your commanders laugh. Oh, Lord. The rest of the night, they were trying to reach a mountain and come back in a minute and a half, which, of course, it took five minutes just to get to the mountain, crawling through thorn bushes, doing everything they could to restore the discipline back to basic training, which Ari had disrupted. And I ask you, does that sound like biblical prophecy to you? It doesn't sound like biblical prophecy to me. You know, in the IDF, I'm a platoon sergeant. We, as commanders, train with the Marines, U.S. Marines. We train, we learn together. At West Point, they don't study the Six-Day War. They say, six days, that's impossible. Who wins a war in six days? We don't study miracles at West Point. We study wars. That is such an exception to the rule. We just don't study it. What I would like to say is that 1948, the Independence Day War, was a far greater miracle than 1967. And here's why. The Jews that survived the Holocaust, those that were left over somehow find their way back to Israel from all over Europe. Jews from Arab countries come back. There's not a real army yet. It's sort of like a militia that sort of makeshift. We went up against five trained militaries. Now, as a platoon sergeant, let me tell you, going into war or going on a mission is complicated. There are orders that need to be given. Ari, you go to the left, cover David. David, you go to the roof, cover to the right at 3 p.m. I mean, there's all these things that are going on. In 1948, understand what had to happen. The platoon sergeant would say, charge. The guy from Russia was saying, excuse me, I'm from Russia. I don't speak Hebrew. What did you say? What did he say? The guy from Poland says, I speak Polish. What are you saying? What did he say? The guy from France says, I only speak French. What is everyone talking about? What is he saying? The guy from Yemen is only speaks Arabic. What is everyone saying? And we won that war? <laughs> it's impossible. That's a miracle. Yes. It's undeniable. A band of Holocaust survivors that couldn't communicate with each other against five trained militaries. And we won that war? It's a miracle. But there were no eagles. There were no clouds. It took faithful Jews to tighten their boots, put on their vests, get their guns, and go out to battle. That's the difference. I'm going to tell you another story. This is the story of my family. At the end, I'm going to ask you, does that sound like biblical prophecy to you? My father was born in Jerusalem. His grandfather was born in Russia. When my grandfather was 15 years old, he walked from Russia to Israel. It took him a year and a half. 1916. I think about what people today, when they're 15 years old, what they're doing and what my grandfather did. I mean, it's like another generation. But life in Russia was so bad for Jews. The anti-Semitism, the hatred. Jews couldn't work. My grandfather picked up, left religion, left his religious home, became a secular Zionist, and walked to Israel. Walked. His hope was to maybe one day found what would be the new Jewish homeland. He arrived in Jaffa. He spent the first year of his life draining the swamps of the north. Now everyone here at Fellowship has been to Israel. That's a mandate of Fellowship. If you have not been to Israel, you are not really a part of this community. <laughs> everyone that's been to Israel will tell you the most beautiful place in Israel 
is around the Sea of Galilee. It's beautiful. It's green. It's lush. The kibbutzim, the vegetation, it's unbelievable there. Before the Jews came back, it was swamp. People died of malaria because of the mosquitoes. It was a desolation. It was swamps in the north and desert in the south. Nothing lived here. Just like the movie said. My grandfather drained the swamps of the north until finally moving to Jerusalem. My father was born in Jerusalem before 1948. So growing up in Atlanta, I heard these amazing stories of what it was like, the nation born in a day, the Six-Day War. How did it happen? To me, Israel wasn't a place that you could actually move to and have a job. It was like the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and my father's bedtime stories. My father finished his service in the IDF at 21. He got on the last ferry to leave Israel. A ferry. He took a boat still. He arrived in New York with $500 in his pocket. His hopes were to go to medical school. In Israel, there was only one medical school at the time. Half of the seats were reserved for kibbutzim. The other half, my dad was too busy playing soccer. He didn't have the grades. So he came to America with the hopes of one day maybe becoming a doctor. With $500, he made one purchase, the Webster's Guide to College Campuses in America. In Israel, I went to law school, rabbinical ordination. When, before I went to my institutions, I had a lot of criteria. I wanted to know where the law school was. I wanted to know who my professors were. I wanted to know how many girls studied there. I had a lot of criteria. I wanted to make sure I got a good education. My father bought the book, and he had one criteria. He looked for the cheapest college in America. He found the cheapest college in the United States of America was right outside Alexandria, Louisiana. Alexandria, Louisiana is a small town. Outside Alexandria, Louisiana is a very small town. In the 1960s, it was a tiny, tiny town. And the college, it was a Baptist Bible college. <laughs> so you can imagine a Jew from Israel that had to get on a boat to get there to go to a Baptist Bible college outside Alexandria, Louisiana in the early 1960s, it was absolutely unheard of. And you know what? Those Christians there loved my dad. They loved him. They supported him. They guided him. They tutored him. They saw it as a blessing to their institution that a Jew from Israel would come and learn with them. They never tried to change him. They never tried to convert him. They just tried to bless him. See, what they did was transform my vision of Christians. Because I don't have a regular Jewish vision of Christians. Most Jews have a baggage of 2,000 years of persecution, of crusades and pogroms, and Hitler talking with the Pope sitting behind him. That's what most Jews have. But these few Christians in the middle of nowhere in Louisiana shifted the course of my life a generation later offering me a new insight into the Christians, building a heart that I have for the Christian world. My father is an incredibly hard worker. He's still a grandfather of 12, and I mean, the work ethic is it's, it's un, it's inspiring. Every night till 9, 10 o'clock at night, he's meeting with patients and healing the sick. Sundays to th Wednesday nights, every night. Grandfather! Still working. You look at his old textbooks, it's unbelievable. Over every other English word is a Hebrew word written in pen. Meaning, my dad sat with the textbook and a dictionary, not Google, and translated entire textbooks of material into Hebrew. Just to understand what was written. Never mind studying for the test. Just to understand the words. He put in 18 hours a day, 19 hours a day. It's not easy to get into medical school in America either. One fateful Saturday night, his friends come to his dorm and they say, you know, you study all the time. Why don't you come out to the game tonight? And my dad said, well, you know, I have been playing. I mean, well, what game are we going to play? And they said, no, you silly Israeli, we're not going to play a game. We're going to watch the college game. And my dad said, oh, we're going to watch it. Well, I like to watch it. What game are we going to watch? And they said, the college team has a 
football game tonight. My dad said, football? I love football. I've been playing football my whole life. Because in Hebrew, football, kaduregel, is soccer. <laughs> so my dad came to the stadium expecting to see a soccer game. And this is how he describes it. I see these big husky Americans with helmets and paddings jumping all over each other. I asked myself, what did America do to soccer? Because <laughs> he still has an Israeli accent. So he's paying close attention to this new game. And this is how he explains it. I see them kicking this egg-shaped ball through this big H, which we would call a field goal. And the crowd went wild. And my dad sort of looked at them and said, well, it was a Baptist Bible college team. They finally got three points on the board. They were very excited. And my dad sort of looked to his friends and said, well, you know, I could do that. And they said, excuse me? He says, well, yes, I've been playing soccer my whole life. I can kick that little egg through that big H. And they said, well, what would a, an Israeli Jew know anything about American football? I was like, I don't know anything about American football, but I can kick that little egg through that big H. <laughs> he looks at them and he says, there's not even a goalie. <laughs> you know, in soccer, there's someone that's trying to stop you. I can kick it as high as I want. I don't have to dribble it. I don't understand this game. <laughs> so they said, well, let's go down to the field and see if you can actually do that. So Sunday morning, they took him down to the field, put the ball on the 20-yard line. And if you look at old football clips in the early 1960s, kickers used to wear funny-looking shoes. They would shave their toes off, and they would run at the ball straight on like this and kick it like that. My dad put the ball down and stood at it at an angle like they do today. And he came and he swung at it like a soccer ball. And it went right through. They were shocked. They had never seen anyone kick a football like that before. And it went right through. And my dad is like, guys, there's not a goalie. There's no one trying to stop me. Well, they said, they must have been lucky. They put the ball on the 30-yard line. The 30-yard line, my dad didn't miss. Put the ball on the 40-yard line. My dad didn't miss. At the 45-yard line, when my dad didn't miss, this is his favorite part of the story. A hush came over the field. <laughs> we have a secret weapon from Israel. <laughs> so very soon, my dad became the star of the football team. He was the high score. They could never make it in the end zone, but now they didn't have to make it halfway down the field let my dad kick a field goal. <laughs> and that's exactly what they did. And you wouldn't believe the stories that my dad has. It was Yom Kippur, but it was the playoffs. My dad is fasting. The sheriff and four police cars are waiting outside the synagogue with sirens, waiting to take my dad from the synagogue to the football field. How could they play without their highest scorer? Well, until today, every Sunday night or every Monday night, 1 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning, because there's a time difference, you can bet that me, my father, my two brothers are watching the Atlanta Falcons game religiously. <laughs> Until this day. Because we say thank God for American football. With American football, my father got a full paid scholarship to Oklahoma University Medical School. <laughs> he was drafted to the Chicago Bears. My dad said, no, thank you. I came here to be a doctor. I like that you're giving me a scholarship. I'm not going professional. Him and another Hungarian guy at the time introduced, there's articles about him, introduced European soccer style kicking to American football. The Hungarian guy's in the Hall of Fame now. My dad, now you know, he's a cool dude. <laughs> 20 years passed. My dad's vision was, I'm going to become a doctor. I'm going to get my license. I'm going to go back to Israel. I'm going to heal the sick. But then he got an internship in Atlanta. Then he got a promotion. Then he got a nicer car. Then he got another promotion. He got a bigger house. And then one year led to another year, led to a bigger promotion and a bigger salary and a bigger home and a bigger car and 20 years of the exile. 20 years. My grandfather walked, drained swamps, and my father got lost in America. Saddam Hussein woke my family up. 1991, he was dropping Scud missiles all over Israel in the Gulf War. 36 missiles blasted Israel. Not one person was killed from the rockets. 
In the middle of the war, my two brothers were at NYU. They dropped out of school, got on the plane, enrolled in Hebrew U, and moved to Israel. As rockets were landing, their planes landed in Ben-Gurion. They volunteered for the IDF. They volunteered in soup kitchens. They did whatever they could to help Israel in their time of need. Now, I told you these two stories, my grandfather's story and my family's story, because after the war calmed down, my parents woke up and said, goodness, our two oldest are in Israel. Maybe it's time we go home. So I was 11 years old at the time, picked up and moved to Israel. See, I believe I've been positioned in a very strategic place. My culture, my mother tongue is English. My culture is American. My wife is from Cleveland. I speak English to my kids. I'm more comfortable in English. But I went to high school in Hebrew, went to law school in Hebrew, rabbinical ordination in Hebrew. I'm a platoon sergeant in Hebrew. I believe that Hashem has placed me as a bridge between America and Israel, Jews and Christians. But my family coming back to Israel the second time is totally different than my grandfather's time. My grandfather was running away from Russia running away from anti-Semitism, away from fear, away from hatred. My family wasn't running away from Atlanta. We had a great life in Atlanta. We were running to Israel, not away from Russia. That's all the difference. Because you can ask every single person here at the fellowship, whenever they go to Israel, they have friends and families that say, are you crazy? You're going to Israel? And then they hear they don't go there to, to travel, they go there to work. They're like, you're doing what? You're going to work? What kind of vacation is that? Go to the Bahamas. Go to Hawaii. What they don't understand is that the fellowship doesn't go to Israel because they love vacation. They go on vacation because they love Israel. That's a totally different revolution. It takes courage to go to Israel now. The redemption of the world is not going to happen through fear and secular Zionism. On the contrary, it's going to happen out of faith and biblical Zionism. Now here's these two stories that I told you. One is of Ari in the Israeli army saying how ugly he is. One is of my father. What a wild story how he finally made it back to Israel. Does that sound like biblical prophecy to you? To me it doesn't. At least not the way that I was educated. That just sounds like a lot of random stories. Maybe they're funny, maybe they're inspiring. Is that prophecy? What I'd like to prove to you today is that it's absolutely prophecy. This is the way God is working in the world. And how do I know this? I know this from a beautiful book that God gave us. And it's a book within a book. It's the book of Ezra. All of you that have a Tanakh with you, a Bible with you, what I'd like you all to do, is to, or an iPhone or a Blackberry, <laughs> is to open up to the book of Ezra. Now what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to give you just enough to really water your taste buds. It's going to enlighten you guys. I have, this teaching is so important We've never made a DVD before about a teaching, ever. Then just for eight years, never. This is such an important teaching, we made a DVD about it. It's an hour and a half long. All of the sources, all of the background, all of the history, they're right outside the door for all of you to take when you leave. What I'm going to do tonight is to give you the background to say, oh my goodness, that's incredible. I need more. But before we start with the book of Ezra, I need to do two things. The first is explain what prophecy is. This is so important. It's given to us through the sages of Israel. Here's the deal. If it rings true, if it rings true in your heart, what I'm about to say, then open your mind to it. Because it's not scripture, these are the sages of Israel talking. An unbroken chain. But if it rings true, and I believe that it will, it will open your eyes to understanding the book of Ezra. Why were these prophecies chosen? That's the question. We know that there were hundreds of thousands of prophets in Jewish history. Hundreds of thousands. In the book of Samuel, they lose their donkey. And they said, go to the prophet. He'll tell you where your donkey is. 
People went to prophets all the time. They were sick, they needed healing, they wanted to find their donkey, they went to a prophet. We only have a very select few prophets in the Bible. Not only that, select prophecies were chosen. The book of Obadiah is one chapter. Well, surely Obadiah had more to say than one chapter in his prophetic career. Why was that one chapter selected? What is this book? We're told through an unbroken chain from the prophets all the way until today. Only prophecies that were written for every generation until the coming of Mashiach entered into the Tanakh. If it was a prophecy for that generation or for that king, it didn't make it. Only a prophecy for every generation until the coming of Mashiach. That entered into the Tanakh. A prophecy for generations. An eternal prophecy. Does that make sense? Here's the key. If it's true for every generation, it was true for their generation as well. Now here's the key. When is Ezra? What is the historical background of Ezra? Ezra lived after the destruction of the first temple. We were sent off to Babylon. The first exile is recorded to be only 70 years. It says it five times in Tanakh. The two big ones are in the book of Jeremiah. Open up to the, to the book of Jeremiah just to read this one with me. Chapter 29, verse 10. For thus said Hashem, after 70 years for Babylonia have been completed, I will attend to you and fulfill for you my favorable promise to return you to this place. Seventy years is promised to us. Seventy years exactly. If Jeremiah says it, he says it twice. Once in 27 and once in 29. He says 70 years. Believe me, it's going to be 70 years. The book of Ezra starts exactly after 70 years. What else does Ezra have? He has a lot more baggage than that. Open up to Isaiah chapter 44 verse 28. Isaiah lived in the times of Hezekiah, hundreds of years before Ezra. Hundreds. Look at what he says. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. He will fulfill my desires to say of Jerusalem, it shall be built. And of the temple, it shall be established. So here we have two keys. Seventy years and Cyrus. Open up to chapter 1 in the book of Ezra. Look at how it starts. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, Ezra says, Cyrus? Isaiah prophesied about Cyrus. He said, Cyrus is the one that's going to restore us to Jerusalem. Upon the conclusion of Hashem's prophecy by the mouth of Jeremiah. Here we have it. Understand the mindset that Ezra is in now, people. If prophecies in the Tanakh were written for every generation, that means they were written for Ezra's generation as well. So what Ezra is writing, it's an autobiography. It's his story of the return to Zion after the first exile. He writes about his hardships, his challenges, his highs, his lows, written with divine inspiration. Specific stories were selected as signs for us in our generation. In fact, Ezra believed that he was the first potential fulfillment of all of the prophets before him. All the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Hosea, all of them... Ezra believed that this was the first time all of those prophecies could come to pass. A house of prayer for all nations, Isaiah wrote. Ezra built a house of prayer for all nations. Ezra, hundreds of years later, it was destroyed in another exile. But as far as Ezra was concerned, he was going to usher in the redemption. So what is the book of Ezra? It's one of the most overlooked books in all of the Tanakh. It's at the end. People don't understand it. It seems irrelevant. It's not so inspiring. It's literally a map. It's a blueprint 
of how Ezra saw those prophecies coming to pass. Why do we have it today? Because if it happened in Ezra's time, it could happen exactly in our time. So now let's look it up into the book of Ezra and what you will see will absolutely dazzle you. Now that you have the right glasses, no one will be voting for Obama this time. (laughs) Who came back? Chapter 1, verse 5. So the heads of the families of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with all those whose spirits God had aroused got up to ascend to build the temple of Hashem which is in Jerusalem. The book of Ezra tells us the people that come back, God had aroused their spirits. They were ideologues. They believed in their return to Zion. They were zealous. They were inspired individuals. God inspired them. Here's a trick. If you open up to Ezra, chapter 9, the entire chapter, Ezra is battling intermarriage. Intermarriage. Ask any Jew. Intermarriage, that's the bottom of the barrel. You can wear this kind of kippah, that kind of kippah, this kind of tzitzis, that kind of Shabbos, this kind of kosher. You marry a Buddhist, you broke the chain. Your grandchildren will not be Jewish. That's the bottom of the bottom. On one hand, the people that came back were inspired. On the other hand, they're secular. They don't care to marry non-Jews. Isn't that unbelievable? How many people have heard the argument, Israel cannot be the fulfillment of biblical prophecy? You know why? It's a secular country founded by secular Zionists. Ezra was a part of that movement. It was a secular movement that married non-Jews How did Ezra know that? Why didn't it bother him? Why didn't it bother Ezra? He's writing this down in the Holy Scripture, and he's telling us that the people that returned were marrying non-Jews. They were secular. How did he know? Where would his confidence come from? If we open up to Ezekiel chapter 36, you'll see. Ezekiel chapter 36 tells us of the return to Jerusalem. Ezra was the first potential time that this prophecy could come to pass. Who does Ezekiel say is going to come back? Chapter 36, verse 24. I will take you from among the nations, and I will gather you from all the lands, and I will bring you to your own soil. Then I will sprinkle pure water upon you, that you may become cleansed. And I will cleanse you from all your contaminations and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and I will make it so that you will follow my decrees and guard my mitzvot and fulfill them. Ezekiel says, yes, the people that are going to come back, they're going to need a new heart. They're going to need a new spirit. Hashem is going to need to put his spear with them that they follow the commandments. Because they're going to come back, they're not going to want to keep the commandments. They're going to want to intermarry. They're not going to be so religious. So Ezra doesn't mind telling us, yes, that's what happened. They came back and they weren't so religious. At the same time, they were inspired by God. If you read the early Zionist writings by Jabotinsky, Ben-Gurion, Herzl, these people were writing poetry on the highest level, inspired about the revival of the Hebrew language, the revival of the nation of Israel, transforming Jews from a religion back into a nation like David. That's what they would write about. And at the same time, they would eat pig on Yom Kippur. It's exactly the same dichotomy that Ezra dealt with. And it didn't bother Ezra, because that's what Ezekiel said would happen. People that say that Israel is a secular country, it can't be. Don't know Ezekiel, because they're supposed to come back and then there will be a spiritual revolution. God will pour his spirit out onto the land after the Jews come back. It may start off secular and it transforms into spiritual. That's the process. It's right here, black on white. A new heart and a new spirit. Let's continue in the book of Ezra. Still the first chapter. Let's continue in verse 1. Upon the conclusion of Hashem's prophecy by the mouth of Jeremiah, Hashem aroused the spirit of Cyrus, 
king of Persia, and he issued a declaration throughout his kingdom. Cyrus, the superpower of that time, who controlled the Middle East, issues a declaration that the Jewish people have a right to live in their ancient homeland. Does that sound like anything familiar in modern Zionism? The Balfour Declaration. That's right. England, the superpower of that time, controlled the Middle East. Zionism, modern Zionism, was born with this incredible declaration of the superpower. That's an interesting parallel. Let's continue. We have the people that came back. So many people will say, no, nah. the big guns, the big rabbis, they stayed behind in Europe. They died in the Holocaust. They went to America. The Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Sadma Rebbe, Moshe Feinstein, all of the big rabbis of the Jewish people, they didn't go to Israel. Well, how could that be biblical prophecy? The spiritual leadership, the rabbis, were like second string rabbis in Israel, except for maybe one or two. Most of the big rabbis didn't move to Israel. Let's look in the book of Ezra, because a rabbi is a modern term. There were no rabbis in the times of Tanakh. The rabbis were the priests. That was their job. Their job was to teach Torah to the nation, bless the nation, and connect them to God. They were the rabbis. In chapter 2, verse 62, it talks about the spiritual leadership that came back in the times of Ezra. It talks about the Kohanim, the priests. These sought their genealogical records, but they could not be found, so they were disqualified from the priesthood. The religious leadership in the time of Ezra, the priests were so poor, they couldn't even prove that they were priests. In the times of the first and second temple, we had records, genealogical records that would go all the way back to Aaron and say, of course I'm a Kohen. My father was a Kohen, and his father was a Kohen. The priests that came back were so second-string priests, they couldn't even prove that they were, and they were disqualified from the priesthood. My favorite verses in all of the Tanakh are Ezra chapter 7, because Ezra himself was a priest, and he's introduced into the Tanakh as Ezra with his genealogical records, as all priests should. And it's incredible to go from the second temple all the way back to Moses and Aaron. After these things, this is when Ezra is introduced onto the scene in chapter 7. During the reign of Ahasuerus, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Chilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Tzaduk, the son of Achitu, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Mariath, the son of Zerachiah, the son of Uzi, the son of Buki, the son of Avishua, the son of Pinchas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the first Kohen. This Ezra ascended from Babylonia. That's a Kohen. You can prove your genealogical records. That's a priest. But the priests that came back with the Jews, they didn't cut it. The big priests, they stayed in New York. They stayed in Europe. They stayed in Babylon. But it didn't bother Ezra. As he's writing down the fulfillment of biblical prophecy for us in these days that we wouldn't be deterred. Let's continue in chapter 2. How many people come back? By the mouth of Jeremiah the prophet. Seventy years. How many Jews come back? There were millions of Jews. How many come back? Verse 64 in chapter 2. The entire congregation numbered 42,360. 42,000. 360. That is such a sad, pathetic number. It's so pathetic that a few verses later, they start counting their horses. They're like, their horses numbered 736. Their mules were 250. It's like they try to beef up the numbers with the animals because the people is so pathetic. Well, people say, well, how could Israel be prophecy? Only a remnant came back. Ah, a remnant of the house of Israel. Of course. Didn't bother Ezra because that's what it said would happen. A remnant of the house of Israel. A remnant of Judah. And he's happily writing this. The fulfillment of Isaiah and Jeremiah. Yes, 42,003. Yeah, perfect. Exactly. This is so exciting. The temple is on its way. So don't let people manipulate you and say, no, no. The secular Zionist movement, it was tiny. It was a fraction. That's not the Jews. The Jews are in New York. No. The Jews are in Israel. 
We open up to chapter 3 now. This is where it gets good. They lay the cornerstone of the temple in Jerusalem. You can imagine. Imagine today if the, um, the dome, the, the golden dome, I'm being recorded so I can't say blown up, but let's say the dome was blown up, right? And we laid the cornerstone of the temple in Jerusalem. Can you imagine what it would, I mean, can, none of you would be here. You would all be like, I'm going to Israel, right? No one would be here. It would be incredible. So you read the verses here. Chapter, it's chapter 3, verse 13. The people did not notice the sound of joyful shouting because of the sound of people's weeping. Although the people shouted with a great shout and the noise was heard from afar. I mean, 70 years of exile, destruction. The Babylonians were a gruesome enemy. So you can imagine the Jews coming back from the Holocaust. They, you saw when they declared the state of Israel, Tel Aviv just erupted in dance in the streets. People were dancing in the streets. And at the same time, they were crying over their losses. It's like crying in joy. It's like, whoa, there's no way to explain it except for these verses. It's the same exact experience. And right at this incredible high, the state of Israel is born. The Temple Mount is in our hand. Judea and Samaria, the Six-Day War. My goodness, we're so close. Things start getting challenging. We have terrorism. Our image in the international media has never been so bad. International pressure. Building freezes in Jerusalem, building freezes in the settlements. Jews fighting other Jews in disengagements from Gaza. It's unbelievable. We're so close. You know, I look at my great great grandparents and I say, wow, their faith. How did they stay Jewish? What? It was been so easy to just become American or become Russian and just assimilate. Wow. And today, as we're living biblical prophecy, now people are losing faith? Insane. But Hashem understood that. And that's why we have the book of Ezra. Let's open up to chapter 4 and see what happens after the great building. The enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people of the exile were building a sanctuary for Hashem, the God of Israel. This is chapter 4. They approached Zerubbabel, who was a descendant of King David. He was going to be the king. And the heads of the families and said to them, Let us build with you, for like you, we will seek your God. Let's make peace. Let's, make, let's build together. Let's sign a peace agreement. Just a verse later, they start killing us. Isn't that interesting? And listen to what they say. It is to him that we have been sacrificing since the days of Esar Hadon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. The enemies of the Jews in the land of Israel, when the Jews were exiled from the land, the king of Assyria brought in another nation, and that's how he assimilated everyone. So the people of the land are saying, excuse me, Jews, you were in Babylon. This is our land now. Let's make peace. And then they start to kill us. Let's see what happens. Verse 4. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and frightened them from building. In Hebrew it says, umivahalim otam, and they frightened them. That's really not a very good word, although it's a correct translation. Is there another word that we know for frighten in English? Terrorize. In fact, that's exactly what they did. They terrorized the Jews. They didn't wage a full-fledged war. It was one Jew stabbed, then ran back into the village. One Qasem rocket dropped. Not a full-fledged war. Terrorized them. One at a time. The same enemy with the same claim to the land, using the same tactics of terror. It's unbelievable. Ezra's writing it all down, and we're living it today. That's unbelievable. Look at it. It's coming to life. It's as if we're reading like the New York Times. We're like reading what's happening. Oh, the peace agreements and the Oslo Accords and the terrorism in the Middle East. Wait till you hear the next one. 
Verse 5. The enemies of Israel, they hired advisors against them to disrupt their plans all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. They hired advisors against them. They literally hired a PR firm to smear Israel's image in the international media. Literally. Can you believe that? They hired advisors to somehow ruin Israel's image. And then what happens? During the reign of Ahasuerus, at the beginning of his reign, they wrote a colmony against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. They went to the superpower of that time, Ahasuerus. And they said, don't let these Jews do what they're doing. Ahasuerus, do you all know where we hear that king from uh, somewhere else in the Bible? Yeah. Esther. That's right. To understand the scroll of Esther and that story, it's a, it's a wild story. Ezra is the historical context to understand the scroll of Esther. Everyone needs to ask themselves, what did the Jews do that God would raise up Haman and try to wipe out all the Jews? Something had to happen. Something had to happen. Meaning, God doesn't just raise up a leader like that with such a decree on Israel for no reason. Well, what does Ahasuerus do? This is chapter 4. We continue now to verse 21. Ahasuerus says, Now issue a decree to halt these people. This city shall not be built until a decree is issued by me. Ahasuerus calls for a building freeze in Jerusalem. It's unbelievable, right? A building freeze. It's Obama Verosh. <laughs> Where did Haman come from? This is what happened. There were Jewish pioneers risking their lives, fighting terrorism, trying to build God's temple, usher in the redemption. There's a king by the name of Ahasuerus that's halting them. When we read the Megillah, and we read about the party that Ahasuerus had in his palace. We read one section in the same tune that we read Lamentations from. The vessels that he used were the vessels of the temple, passed to him by the kings of Babylon. Imagine, the Jewish people are fighting for the redemption in Israel. The whole world hates them. Terrorism, risking their lives. Ahasuerus says, building freeze. And you know what the Jews are doing? They're celebrating in the White House lawn. They're celebrating with Ahasuerus as their brothers are trying to build Jerusalem. And God says, you're celebrating with Ahasuerus? Haman, rise up, wipe them out. That's the historical context. That's what's happening. Jews were literally, can you imagine the concept that Jews would be raising money for the Democratic Party? Who would have thought? It's an impossibility. And every single thing that we see is happening today, I'm not making this up. This isn't Jeremy Gimpel's commentary. I'm just reading. I just gave you the proper lens through which you should look at the book. This is not commentary. This is not my opinion. I'm just quoting verses. I'm just going chronologically through the story of Ezra. And here's where it got really hard for me in Israel. It was the most challenging time. I've been through wars. I've been through impossible missions. Friends of mine have died next to me. I have gone through hell in Israel. The hardest time of my life was during the disengagement. I don't mind going out to battle against an enemy. They're an enemy. I understand that. We need to fight them. We need to beat them. But the disengagement was so confusing because Jewish soldiers were sent with force against other Jews. And Jews were fighting Jewish soldiers. And I'm fighting a soldier, but I'm a soldier. And, and it was ugly. I mean, for Jews to use force and power against each other, it was, it was like destruction. It was impossible. It was, what do you tell your children? That the, that the, that the army and the police are bad? Uh, I mean, it's a breakdown of society. Jew against Jew? I mean, it was like the whole country was broken. 
that a Jew would lift a hand against another Jew, that the government would send in Jewish soldiers to stop us? The book of Ezra continues. Verse 23 in chapter 4. Then as soon as the text of King Ahasuerus's letter was read before Rehum and Shimshai the scribe and their cohorts, they went in haste to Jerusalem to the Jews and halted them with force and power. Because you can imagine what happened. The Jews that were in Jerusalem, they're like, I don't care what Obama Verosh says. I'm building the temple. And the political leadership said, no, you're not. I'm sending in soldiers, and I'm going to halt you with force and power. And right when I thought that that couldn't possibly be our way to redemption, I see that it's exactly what Ezra went through. And as he's writing it word for word with divine inspiration for our time, we would have a biblical blueprint of a potential scenario of how Mashiach would come, a potential scenario for how the redemption would unfold. There are no miracles here, people. There are no big eagles. There are no clouds of glory. It's people with faith, a remnant of the house of Israel with faith. And here's where it gets good right as we're about to break, right as we have no hope, right as it seems the whole world is against us, we have chapter 5. Thank God for chapter 5. <laughs> we, have the, we have the keys, <laughs> right? That's why this book is so good. We know the ending. Well, we are right now exactly on the border of chapter 4 and chapter 5. That's where we're at now on this blueprint. I cannot write this off as coincidence. Anyone that writes this off as coincidence is insane. How could this be written thousands of years ago? They're writing today's headlines in the newspapers. It's insane. It's obviously prophecy. We just need to know how to read into it. So what happens in chapter 5 is the revolution. The political leadership, Zerubbabel, Shimshai, Rechum, all of these people, they take a side's role. And the spiritual leadership rises up in Israel. Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, son of Edo, the prophets, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah in the name of the God of Israel. Chapter 5, a spiritual revolution happens. Ezra comes on board, the Kohen of all Kohens, and they inspire the Jews in the land to fight against all odds and build the temple of God because this is not a political battle. People that talk about the 67 borders are missing the point. This is a spiritual battle. And what happens in chapter 5 is spiritual men are lifted up, chosen by God. And they say, go inspire the nation. Go inspire the world. And look what happens. In chapter 6, the temple is constructed. They're building the temple, and they celebrate the first Passover. This part, folks, is for you. Get ready. Verse 15. This temple was completed by the third day of the month of Adar during the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. Verse 19. The people of the exile brought the Passover offering on the 14th day of the month. Verse 21, if you don't look for it, you'll just miss it. The children of Israel who had returned from the exile ate it, together with all those who had separated themselves from the defilement of the nations of the land, to join them and to seek Hashem, the God of Israel. Look at what happens in the times of Ezra. Not all the nations, those that choose to remove themselves from the defilement of the nations and attach themselves to Israel. They come and they celebrate Passover in the temple of God together with the Jews. Is that unbelievable? Because I know that's what this pastor has been teaching, that's what this pastor has been teaching, that's what this church has been teaching. And what I want to tell you is that this is what the Bible is teaching. 
How does Ezra know this? How did he write this? Where is this scene? If there is one verse from all of the Tanakh that I want you to remember and then engrave in your brains that whenever there are any doubts, whenever there are any wonders, who you are, what you are, what you believe, remember Isaiah 14. Everyone say it together. Isaiah 14. Perfect. Isaiah 14 was before Ezra. Ezra knew that something had to happen with the nations. He knew it. And here, lo and behold, he saw it actually materialize in his time. What does Isaiah chapter 14 say? It's at the very beginning. For Hashem will show mercy to Jacob. He will choose Israel again and grant them rest upon their land. The stranger, the non-Jew, the stranger will join them and be attached to the house of Jacob. He knew that there would be strangers that remove themselves from the defilement of the nations and attach themselves to Israel. And as we see, they celebrate the first Passover. They celebrate it together. Is that unbelievable? Ezra had three goals when he came to Israel. One was to revive the Hebrew language. After 70 years, it wasn't lost but listen, 70 years behind the Iron Curtain of Russia, people would forget Hebrew. Babylon was the same. Ezra, the Torah portions, translations, that began in the times of Ezra. He instituted the Torah portions that we study every week. He revived the Hebrew language by teaching them Torah. His second purpose was to spread the law throughout the land, that people would live a godly life. Did you know that today in Israel there is more Torah being studied in the land than ever before in the history of the world? We're literally living in prophetic times. We're expecting eagles and clouds and miracles, and it's not going to happen. We are not looking for the right thing. The book of Ezra is here to teach us that. There is not one miracle here. But as far as Ezra is concerned, that is the fulfillment. Why? It's a higher level of understanding. It's a higher level. Because when miracles happen, we're spectators of God's miracles. We watch them. Look at what God is doing. What Ezra is saying is that the redemption is not going to be spectators. We're going to be partners with God. We're going to be a part of his miracles. We're going to have the faith to tie up our boots, go out to war. We're going to have faith to do things that we've never done before and leave the defilement of the nations and attach ourselves to Israel. That takes faith. That takes courage. People will ridicule you. I'm not happy with just pro-Israel. I want the whole deal. That's why I'm here. And let me tell you, it's happening today. This Sukkot, I made a video. Some of you may have seen it. But it's important for the Jewish people to make videos because it's not about the Jews. It's about the Gentiles. There is a revolution that's happening. There are Christians from all over the world. You would not believe what it looks like that are going to Jerusalem and celebrating Sukkot with the Jews. It's a prophecy in the book of Zechariah. Zechariah, we just he was prophesied in the time of Ezra. He said, nations will come and celebrate Sukkot in Jerusalem. And now you see literally Africa, China, Japan, all over Europe coming with their flags, all of the nations. Could it be that we're now starting the beginning process of the vision that Zechariah had? I want to show you this next video. the city of Jerusalem turns green and yellow. And despite our deep historical ties with the state of Wisconsin and our well-known affinity for cheese, this has nothing to do with the Green Bay Packers. 
Throughout the city, families build these little booth-like huts that they live in throughout the holiday. They have a citron fruit and a date palm, it's called a lulav and an etrog in Hebrew, that we use to worship God on the holiday of Sukkot. To the untrained eye, the overwhelming sensations on the holiday of Sukkot may be so extreme that they may not notice a very curious phenomenon. The Gentiles. Shalom, Goyim. Shalom to you. In the midst of a biblical holiday celebrated exclusively by the Jewish people, today we see as many, if not more, non-Jews making the voyage to Jerusalem to celebrate Sukkot. The last time we saw anything like this, representation from all nations of the world, was in Solomon's temple over 3,500 years ago. It shall be that all who are left over, the remnant of the nations who had come to Jerusalem, will go up every year to worship the King Hashem, Master of Legions, and to celebrate the festival of Sukkot. People aren't just coming to Jerusalem to celebrate this festival. There are families all over the world from different backgrounds, different religious affiliations, that are building little huts outside their homes, freaking out their neighbors, all to celebrate the biblical festival of Sukkot. Like all things in Judaism, there are some rules that apply to building a sukkah. Through the Hebrew word sukkah as written in the Torah, we're able to see that a sukkah may have two and a half, three, are preferably four walls. The height of a sukkah cannot exceed 20 cubits, while the width cannot exceed infinity. That's right, a sukkah can be as wide as you want. The laws of building a sukkah reveal the essence of the holiday. A sukkah can be as expansive as possible to include as many people as possible, because one day the entire world will leave the security of their homes and enter into the ultimate sukkah in Jerusalem. Hope to see you there. Chag Sameach. Happy holidays from Russia. We love. <laughs> Happy holidays from Jerusalem to Mexico. Chag Sameach from South Africa. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. Chag Sukkot Sameach. Happy Sukkot. If you want to share with you, go for it and share with you. If you want to share with you, go for it. Oh, 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 oh. You can share with you. But there are people that have enough faith that are just crazy enough to say, you know what, if Zechariah says, I'm doing it. I'm going to go up to Jerusalem. And it started, and it's getting bigger, and it's getting bigger, and it gets bigger every year. And it's unbelievable. They've marched through the streets of Jerusalem from every nation, and the Jews are like, what on earth? And it's inspiring to them. But here is what needs to happen. And this may ruffle some feathers, but I know that that's in the heart of this church. Instead of trying to change the Jew, the world needs to embrace the Jew. They need to say, Jews, we want to be like you, not the other way around. We want to learn more about you because when I learn about you, I really reveal who I am on a very, very basic, fundamental level, the authors of the New Testament were Jewish. They lived a Jewish life. They celebrated Jewish holidays. They ate Jewish food. The more you understand about the Jews, the more you understand about yourselves. That's the secret to world peace. If the target would be removed from the Jew, we can't be the target. On the contrary, we're meant to be the light. Don't extinguish our light. The whole world is trying to extinguish our light. People that would say that they have good intentions. God promised the Jews would be eternal. An eternal covenant. It can't be broken. 
no matter what. A promise. It's eternal. God is fulfilling all of the promises. He's fulfilling them today to Israel. Don't tell me that he's fulfilling all of these promises with an eternal covenant. Prophecies are happening only to kill us and throw us to hell. Impossible. I don't believe it. In the New Testament, it says all of Israel will be saved. We're done. We're done. What I'm calling for then is, is, is faith, to not try to meddle with the Jews. If the world would stop meddling with us, God has a specific plan for us. He's guiding us. Don't meddle with it. Because you know what happens when they start meddling with our plan? It's not ours. It's God's plan. They say, well, well, why don't you come to church? Here's a ham sandwich. Stay in Orlando. That is not the plan for us. And they have good intentions. Good people. But God made an eternal covenant with us. There's no asterisk. There's no little, little, uh, there's no back of the contract. Eternal promise. And the New Testament will be saved. All of us. Don't worry about us. If we could change that, my goodness, do you understand the partnership that could be between Jews and Christians? You don't even understand. I would say things that are so radical, I would get thrown out of Israel. But I'm going to say it anyway. The Jews would build churches. We would build them. We're not a proselytizing religion. That's not what we do. That's not our mandate. We are not meant to proselytize. There are far too many Jews already. (laughs) We don't want you to be Jews. We want you to be the best Christians you can be. That's the honest truth. We really believe that. A good Christian is going to heaven. If we knew that the guns would never be pointed at us, It would never flip around and then they're coming after us. If we knew that, there would be a brotherhood. Right now there's a strategic alliance. And I'm not comfortable with it. I'm being honest. Jews and Christians are lining themselves because it's good for Israel. It's politically wise. Let's watch them here. Let's watch them there. This is good for us now, but let's keep them at a distance. I don't like that. Right? It's uncomfortable. It's weird. Jews feel guilty about it. They're taking money from Christians. And it's like awkward. And it's like weird. And no one... No. If the guns, if we're not the target, and we go off to Saudi Arabia, they should be the target. They need to learn about love. They need to learn about redemption. They need to learn about the God of Israel. What a partnership. Do you understand the revolution that could happen? But I know that's going to take... See, this community is very advanced. Very advanced. The cutting edge. You're practically already with us celebrating Passover in Jerusalem. You just happen to be in Orlando or whatever. If you could, you would be there already. But it's your mission to find those that have a heart for Israel and take them to the next level. Because that's the only way there'll be a brotherhood between us. And believe me, I know it in my soul of souls that there is meant to be a brotherhood between us. A brotherhood, partners, can you imagine? Partners. Partners in miracles. Because it would take an absolute miracle to bring Jews and Christians, after what we've been through, together, it would take a miracle. But I believe in miracles. So I want to bless everyone today. That you find renewed faith in the Tanakh. That you find inspiration in the Word of God. That you find leadership with the Jewish people and that you let the Jewish people be the best Jews that they can be, and that you, through the Jewish people, find out who you really are and celebrate Sukkot with us in Jerusalem. God bless you all. Thank you.